Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Mark Coffee Coaching Podcast. I'm delighted to introduce my guest this evening is Gemma Keo, a nutritional therapist who is based on Catherine Street in Waterford. Gemma, good evening, and thank you for joining me. Hello, how are we? <laughs> all good. Um, first of all, how are you um, coping with being stuck at home and running a business uh, with children running around the house all day long? <laughs> I spoke to one person today and I think she summed it up nicely she's like yeah I'm great I'm going slowly insane but I'm great <laughs> it's happening so slowly I don't even know what's happening um look like everybody on this earth you know we're all just I think I don't know how you find it Mark but for me like I have three Somalis um and I kind of find that each week that ticks by, we're just, we're, we're settling into it a little bit better. You know, you kind of sort out your system for the homeschooling and the schoolwork that needs doing, and you sort out your system for the incessant snacking and wanting food all the time. And then you sort out your system for your work and how that happens. So it's far from perfect, but look, we're getting there. And I think, look, we've been so lucky. We can still get out. You know, I've, I've a sister-in-law yeah. in Spain and, and, you know, they've literally been in living in a two bedroom apartment for how many, ever many weeks they've been locked in without being able to leave. And, and they have a small child as well. who's only three. So I can't wow. imagine how challenging that is. So I think in the grand scheme of things, we're okay. We, we, we've got it easy. <laughs> I think so. Um, so for anyone that um, hasn't heard from you before, Gemma, you might give us a little introduction to, um, I suppose, your background, how you got into um, the nutrition uh, therapy side of things, and um, maybe tell us a little bit about what you do day to day. So I worked in pharmacy. I worked in retail pharmacy. I did my first day age 14, and I did my last day age 30. So 16 years in pharmacy wow. um, and I always loved it and, and I suppose I always loved that person-to-person -person interaction and look it's very cliched but I did always just love helping people just loved being helpful um, but I suppose all the while I was working in pharmacy in, in different roles over the years there was definitely an itch that wasn't being scratched and I remember talking to my mom when I was really small, and this is a really vivid memory that I have, and not a great example for as, as a nutritional therapist, but I'm gonna share it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my mom bringing home a Chinese takeaway when Chinese was like really snazzy, like really, you know, new. And fancy. this one, was, yeah, fancy, yeah, really fancy. And I, I always loved the bean sprouts. So he's just say to her, just get me a portion of the bean sprouts. And uh, I remember saying to her, I was probably eight or nine years of age, are these good for me? She's like, why are you even asking me that question? Um, and oh, I don't know where it came from or how it sparked, but all through the years, um, I, I lived on the wind until puberty kicked in around age 13. I could have existed on nothing. And as soon as the hormones hit, then my appetite took off. And I just always had an interest um, in, in what food did to us or did for us or what effect it had. So when i was working in in pharmacy i discovered a course in nutritional therapy four-year diploma course which is what i studied um, and i did that all the while i was working um in pharmacy i suppose i initially started out not necessarily thinking it could become a career just purely doing it for my own interest um, but really loved it and by the end of it then kind of went yes definitely you know this is for me this is this is what i want to be doing 24 7. I love what you said there about um, purely doing it out of self-interest, you know, just curiosity and wanting to learn a little bit more. Um, and I think that's a common theme, even through friends of mine that I know that are into health and fitness and nutrition and training and weights and that kind of stuff, is most of the people tend to do it for themselves initially and then realize that, you know, they might give a few tips and tricks here and there and realize, you know what, I'm enjoying this, you know, and, and people seem to be taking... I suppose my advice to heart and they're using it and it's helping them and it makes me feel great and they feel great. Um, and the fact that you said that you just love helping people. Um, do you know, it really, it, it, I suppose it, it shows to the type of person that you nearly have to be, to be good at what you do. You have to care. Yeah, you do. Like only yesterday I was on a call to a client and I remember kind of saying to them, because sometimes I often, I often wonder what clients are thinking when you're making suggestions to them. You know, I often wonder, they think, oh my God, she's, 
crazy. Like I'm never going to <laughs> do that or eat that or buy that supplement. But I always kind of say to people, once, once, once we do our info gathering section and then we move into the, the, uh, the section where I start making some suggestions for them, I always say, look, I'm now going to speak to you as if you were my brother, sister, husband, you know, best friend, someone in my immediate family. If you came to me with said problem, this is exactly, I'm telling you now what I would tell them. So I always try and talk to people because I, I remember hearing, you know, doctors in, in their training that this is how they're kind of taught. You know, if you've got to deliver some really bad news, you put yourself in that person's shoes and you make sure that you have that human connection. And I just think that's so important. Um, yeah, so sorry, I digress. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I think you have to want to help. You know, you couldn't be in a profession like this if you didn't really care about people you know yeah, it's like the old adage it, it, do no harm you know was rule number well, one first do no harm yeah hopefully hopefully you help but absolutely um at worst you do no harm so tell me a little bit about as i was going to ask about your um what does your average day look like but i suppose these days during the covid19 pandemic just in case someone's listened to this in five years time and they have no idea what we're on about um <laughs> like on, a, on, on an average day is it is it one-to-one -one clients is it groups what way do you what way do you work on a day to day basis? Um, it's becoming more and more group work, um, which I love. <clears throat> but typically, I suppose before COVID nineteen pandemic and lockdown and all that, it very much was one to one work with maybe maybe some group sessions with with companies or something like that kind of thrown in. Um, so at the moment, it's I, I try. I try and put all of my clients together into the one day just so that I get into that headspace and I'm in that zone and I kind of find I'm much more creative when the wheels, you know, with my ideas and, and information comes to me better when I'm in the zone rather than taking two people on a Monday and two people on a Friday. I, I put them all into a Wednesday. So a Wednesday, yeah, at the moment, it's all this. It's Zoom consultations or phone or WhatsApp. I mean, whoever came up with zoom five years ago could not have known could they how well they were going to do out of this I um, should have, we should have bought yeah. we should have all bought shares when this all started <laughs> hindsight is a great thing but um yeah so that's it so it's like if i'm working one-to-one -one with someone so at the moment let's just say <clears throat> because as you rightly mentioned there we have you know we all are working from home with small children there's a lot to be packed into a day you know so i find what I'm doing at the moment is I'm, I'm getting up around 6 or 6.30 to, to get a bit of peace and quiet and a bit of headspace and a cup of coffee when no one else is up um, and, and do a bit of work, kind of make a start on the day. Um, and if you'd asked me a year ago, would I ever see myself doing that? I was said, absolutely not. Love the lab. I love the yeah. extra half an hour or whatever it is in the morning like we all do. And it is a little bit painful getting up, but actually it's great. It, 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 what I get done in those couple of hours in the morning is probably what would take me four or five hours later in the day. So it's a bit of work. Then it's breakfast with everyone. And then around 10 a.m. it's maybe sit down and take some clients or I might have other Zoom calls to do. Or now at the moment with COVID, it is a bit more online group work with some companies, which is great. Um, and I'm loving that. Lo love that. Love a bit of diversity. I think... I don't know if you feel the same, but you know, when you're a sole practitioner and it's just you and your business, yeah. it's nice to have a few different things going on. You know, it's great. And even like you said about having the, having yourself in the, in the, in the headspace to get through it all, you know, and scheduling it all in such a way that you're, you're in the zone and you start, you get, you get that flow going and you're just, you're ready. Um, whereas if you said, if you have a client at 10 AM and then all of a sudden it's, it's hurling <laughs> in the kitchen or it's, football on the green or it's feeding the baby and then you're trying to come back into your office or wherever you have in your house and you're trying to say right what was I doing yeah that can be yeah, very hard I find that really hard yeah a ditto I'm exactly the same and I kind of like to just I suppose move through it all as well and kind of I'm a great one for the lists I don't know what you're like but I love taking things off lists and go right that's that client taking care of and that's that um, client taking care of and 
great at making lists, not so good at actually getting everything on the list done. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I don't think anyone does, Mark. And if they tell you they do, they're lying yeah. <laughs> because I never clear all of my workload. And I don't, and I'm by no means the most productive person on earth, but I don't, anyone I talk to who's honest kind of says, yeah, I never get to the bottom of my to-do list, yeah. you know? Never ending anyway. With kids and your own house, there's always something to to add to the list um well we'll tell ourselves that anyway yeah. won't we? that'll make us all feel better <laughs> fact <laughs> um so you mentioned that obviously you're working with different groups and one-to-one -one clients and companies and stuff like that are there any commonalities in terms of the results that people want when they start working with you Gemma is it is it for health is it to lose some weight um is it because of um health issues like like diabetes or something like that that they come to you for help it is namely <clears throat> i'm very often the last person people call so what i often hear is i've tried everything i've tried everything else um for some people they would say you know medications aren't working or they don't suit me you know all the, i all, see all those side effects in the list i get all of them so i can't take them um but very often yes they have health concerns and to be honest i f i feel that's where i work with people best is when they have X condition, whether it is diabetes or you know high cholesterol or, or angina or some sort of cardiovascular disorder, um, or for in women it could be fertility or hormone issues or something like that that they've maybe read a little bit about food and the power that food can have on their condition, and they want a little bit of support from that side of things. Um, so yeah, that's namely it really. Is nutritional therapy or even just people helping people with their food is it totally under prescribed from the medical side of things like you said people come to you because they've tried everything else is nutrition one of the first things people should be trying and they're just not getting that uh what's the word i'm looking for they're not getting that influence from their doctor or from whoever they might be working with to say well look nutrition plays a massive part you have these health issues but you know your food may not actually be be helping it might actually be exacerbating your symptoms or stalling your recovery from it um yeah well i, I mean i know i'm biased <laughs> and i'm absolutely going to say yes i think so i i really do think so um i think it's no coincidence that we probably now we have a great awareness i think now of health <clears throat> however we also have a huge amount of fast, highly processed, cheap food available, um, which is quite, you know, is, is not good for anyone. Yeah. Um, and I think we're moving and really moving away from eating real, whole real food. And I think that is playing a huge part. I mean, when you look at the big reports that are published each year, whether it's like the um, World Cancer Report and, and studies from the WHO, they will often cite that diet and lifestyle probably drives anywhere between 30 and 50% of all chronic diseases that wow. we have at the moment. So yes, food play, it's not everything. And, and honestly, when I left college, um, when I graduated 10, nearly 11 years ago, I thought food was the cure all. And I thought it was the answer to everyone's problems. And if everyone just ate properly, that the world would be fabulous. Um, and I, you know, I now realize health and, and that kind of, you know, 360 degree approach to health is about so much more than just food. But I do think it's a really undervalued medicine and I get in trouble for saying this all the time, but it is a medicine at the end of our forks, you know, and it, it, it like it does have that influence and it does have, um, I suppose, a lot of really beneficial properties. And I think the more that we can see just food being explored as a possible intervention. I'm not saying, as I said, you know, no, no snake oil cures here. Not saying it's the only route to health. It's by no means is, but it, it really does play a huge role. Like food is so much more than calories and fuel. It, it gives our body chemical messages about what's going on in the outside world, in its environment. And it can influence our gut bacteria largely, which we know play huge roles now in, um, mediating disease and in triggering disease and it also by the same token in in kind of modulating and, and dampening down disease and that's just one example you know it's a huge influencer on our mood on our sleep 
on our anxiety levels, on our hormone issues, on our fertility. Yes, I, I, I kind of believe that there's probably no area that isn't untouched by food. And I love what you said about food is not just calories. It's not just fuel. Do you know, it's not just some, uh, oh, substance. Um, yes, exactly. That, um, we just eat it for the sake of eating it. Um, it obviously has effects on us, but it's also, a, it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's a mood thing. Like we use food to celebrate. We have, we have birthday cakes, do you know, we, we have, Christmas puddings, we have Easter eggs, we have, you know, and food is associated with so much more than just, I, I need fuel, <laughs> I need to go for a run, I need fuel. Um, the smell is associated with going into like your mom's house for a Sunday dinner and stuff like that and just the smell of the gravy and the roast chicken and, you know, it oh, just... Oh, stop what I wouldn't give for mammy dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the, the fact that obviously you mentioned about processed foods can be linked to 30 to 50 percent of lifestyle related um, illnesses or diseases Gemma what can people like you and I do or even people that that aren't working as as nutrition coaches or personal trainers and that kind of stuff how can we help people towards making those better choices is it is it posting about it on social media is it scare tactics do the government need to play a bigger role like how can we or reverse that how can we show people that do you know a lot of the time the diets that we're eating the majority of the time for the majority of the population are leading them towards whether it's being overweight obesity leading and all the health related things associated with that then like you said like diabetes like high cholesterol and um, high blood pressure um you know heart issues and things like that as well where where do you start do you know when you say people are coming to you for almost like a last resort. Um, how can we make it so that people are coming to us first? Um, yeah, that's a really big question. And I, I really don't claim to have any concrete answers at all. I can only share with you, I suppose, a few, a few musings. And I don't know. I, I, I often think this, and I have this conversation with my husband a lot. And, um, it, you know, you're, you do constantly wonder, how do we fix this? There is no quick fix, that is for sure. It has become a cultural thing now, you know, whereby fast food is kind of fast processed refined food. You know, I, I'm sure you've been the same. I, I've been in some of the city centre supermarkets at one o'clock in the day when kids are released from school for their lunch break. You see them in their uniforms. I've been behind a gang of boys walking into a supermarket and their challenge is to feed themselves for 50 cent. And just as a little social experiment one day, like the crazy person that I am, I followed them around <laughs> and I wanted to see what they brought to the checkout. What were they all going to have for 50 cent? And it's really, it's really, it's quite grim that they could buy themselves um, a packet of biscuits and there was something else, gosh, I can't remember, it was something else boxed. Those two things didn't cost them a cent more than 50 cent. And that was their lunch you know so it's starting literally at grassroots like it's it's you know it's it's from the ground up um i think i but that's one of my big bugbears is that processed high now when i say highly refined processed food i'm talking about you know i'm talking about the kind of the boxed breakfast cereals biscuits and um, ready meals you know it it shouldn't cost a family more to buy whole real food to feed themselves with like a you know some sort of cut of meat or fish and fruit and veg and some potatoes it shouldn't cost them more to buy that than it does cost them to buy a boxed ready meal that you either add water to or you just unwrap it take it out of the freezer and put it on a tray in the oven like there's something very wrong about that are we losing the ability to cook i think so a little <clears throat> i do think so um sometimes i feel like i'm actually the wrong person to ask about all this because i'm kind of <laughs> you know yourself like we, we we don't have the insights that the common joe has because this is our world like the, you know my world is like my girls they're eight years of age they could probably totally fend for themselves right now they can cook omelets and um, they can make Correct. desserts they can make smoothies you know they help me peel and chop regularly but that's my world i i've i've consciously gotten them in on that there's a lot of people who that isn't their world you know their world is god 
I have a fiver in my purse. Can I go to the local shop? And, you know, can I feed us all tonight for that? Like, it's a very, very different reality. So, yeah, I think I do, though. I think a lot of it is back to cooking and back to, I'm sure you would say the same about your grandmother. My grandmother could have made a meal out of oh, nothing, yeah. like absolutely nothing. There could be leftovers in the fridge and there could be a couple of eggs and that's it. You'd have something delicious half an hour later, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I still remember the smell of the chuck stew from going into my nan's house oh, yeah. um, at lunchtime and um, you'd be using the, the slice of batch bread that she'd be after making as well or she'd be after getting it up in the bakery or something like that to mop up the rest of the gravy and stuff afterwards but it was real wholesome food you know <laughs> um, and I remember even when, I, when I moved out of um, Mam's house and, and Seth and Zara moved in I think it was I'd say it was easily two or three years before I ended up going up to Mam and said Mam how do you make soup because I was in the house one day and I just had a, a craving for some soup and it wasn't that I hadn't gotten it when I was younger but I had never actually cooked it because mom was always the one that used to bring in the veg, she'd chop them, cook them, whatever, and then she just called, dinner's ready. And that, that was it, then we're all out at the table. But like you said, it's engaging kids, I suppose, the next generation in cooking, prepping, um, and helping around the house. Like, like you said, your kids could probably fend for themselves. Like Tommy could make scrambled eggs, sliced toast. Um, he helps me chop the veg if we're doing a bit of soup and gives out to me that it's not his nanny's recipe, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, and keep and and I think those high standards for kids are brilliant. You know what I mean? Like let let them give out to you for what you didn't do right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely holding me to task. I do. Can you? Oh yeah, for sure. But I suppose that's what's happening is there isn't a lot of cooking going on at home, perhaps. You know, and I think look, it's probably like everything in life. There are there are dichotomies. There are people who are really trying to do everything right, <clears throat> and then. There are people who need a bit more help and a bit more support. There are people who probably don't really know how to feed their family with like what we're talking about, fresh, whole, real food, because they were never shown yes. um, and the cooking skills are being lost. And like, you know, my mother was kind of saying that when she, so she was married, let's say, when was she married? In the late 60s, early 70s. And she said it was just on that era where the things like the, you know, the instant um, custard was coming in, like powdered custard. And there was a few yeah. more kind of like that, like corners were starting to be cut. You know, the, the food industry was really taken off. And she said, like, if she was to tell her friends at that time that she was making custard from egg yolks and sugar and, and scratch, that she was like perceived as old fashioned, that the modern, yeah. the new modern housewife was you know was buying these products because they made her life easier and and this is i think what has just become ingrained all through the years whereas now like now you see the person who's grown a bit of veg in their back garden maybe you're doing a bit more cooking and, and they are seen as really modern and progressive yeah. and all over it so i think food is a bit fashionable as well it's like fashions over the years you know it comes and goes Definitely. Um, I, lo I love what you said about uh, food products. I think it was um, many moons ago. I, Sarah even asked me how many years ago did you do the talk down in uh, Tracy's Hotel down in Spirit Forest. And I actually can't remember. It was probably like five, six maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, neither can I. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll skip over that part. Um, yeah, but <laughs> I, I, I'm nearly certain that it was, it was you that said it, but... Um, when you mentioned products there, it just triggered in my head. You said that if um if a food has more than five ingredients, um it's not a food; it's a product. You know, real food is the ingredients. Yeah, that's it. You know, like carrots don't have an ingredient list. Apples don't have an ingredients list. You know, olive oil or butter, it's cream and salt and thyme and and you know nothing else. So, yeah, exactly. If we could just focus more on putting those foods in our trolley that don't have an ingredients list and the more we can do that and that's little steps you know yeah. if you're only in the habit of maybe putting a bag of spuds in the trolley and maybe a net of onions put in a head of cabbage you know cook it up with the potatoes like just baby steps one or two more whole real foods at a time but i do think <clears throat> i think farming and and the price for the farmer um and i think people not knowing how to grow their own food. I don't know how to grow my own food. We moved house in January. I thank God now have a garden. And the reason you're seeing nothing but clutter over my shoulder <laughs> is we had a load of stuff, load of jobs lined up to be done in the house and literally COVID struck. Yeah. So over my shoulder is a, a, a sink and new counterboards and everything that were meant to be fitted and done. 
But um, just since we moved in here and we've got a garden space, I, I am now thinking I'm this green finger goddess because I have the most amazing lettuce um, that I can snip and eat when I want growing out the back. And the girls actually were just out playing and they just showed me our first few strawberries are coming on the strawberry oh, plant. Yeah. And like, that's my level of understanding growing. But when I was growing up, you know, I grew up very, very rural, rural Waterford, grass growing in the middle of the road where I grew up. And, um, you know, you, you traded bags of fruit and veg, like for favors with neighbors and stuff. That's the way it was done. And it was brilliant, gorgeous. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think, like you said as well, a lot of the, the attitudes around food now is becoming a lot more, a lot more artisan, a lot more, um, it's becoming trendy to, to grow in your back garden, to have planters on the windowsill with your fresh herbs, um, you know, to have a, a, a patch in your garden or to have a, an old pallet repurposed as a, as a planter and stuff like that for, for different types of fruits. Um, the waste issue as well with buying all of that stuff in the, in the supermarket, like a lot of the stuff that doesn't have the ingredients is in plastic bags and all that kind of stuff. And we won't get into all that kind of stuff now, but I just wanted to throw in that, you know, that that, I think a lot of attitudes are starting to change around food um, and people are becoming a lot more um, cultured, I suppose is the word I would use, that, you know, people that, like you said, years ago, the Chinese was like the height of sophistication. It was like, oh my God, we're getting a Chinese. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. Know. But, you know, oh, there's chopsticks with it. Oh my God, we are so posh. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. whereas, <laughs> what do we do with these? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> whereas now I think that if you get a takeaway, you know, if you don't get the plates delivered as well, and it's not in some type of compostable um, pub or something like that, that it's almost nearly frowned upon by people that are... Um, I suppose interested in that kind of thing to know that their their standards are a little bit higher. Absolutely, and I suppose, but the message I'd love to convey to anyone who's listening and maybe feels that they aren't a great cook or they're not terribly, you know, they're not what you'd could maybe call a foodie, is that it doesn't have to be complicated either. Like, yes, I, I, you know, personally, I love um, a really nice Thai or something real tasty, and and you know, like that. But just as much, I love like that, a nice roast or a good stew or a good chili or, you know, and the great thing is tons of free resources out there as well. Like you can Google a recipe now for absolutely anything and you can Google like beginners chili con carne, beginners vegetable soup, beginners yeah. Irish stew, whatever it is, it's all there. So I think that's my point is I think, you know, everything from a health point of view I don't think the problem is a lack of information. No. As such, per se, it's not, it's not the only issue. Yes, it is great to keep telling people and educating people, and it is really important from a public health point of view to get those messages out there. But um, I think a lot of it is, is the cultures we're passing down, and we've not passed down a culture of, <clears throat> of cooking from scratch. And, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think one of the things I've found around, like you said, it's not a lack of information. Um, but I think that I think the overwhelm of information around nutrition as well is something that so many people get totally overwhelmed by. They get bombarded by this food is good, this food is bad. You know, don't eat this. You know, there'll be mushrooms going out of your head if you eat this. You're not allowed to cook that this this way. Do you know, <laughs> um, that you know the, the second you eat. Um, I think you said it as well in one of one of your talks. Um, I took all those notes. I was very studious at those talks. Um, you, you, meant, you know, <laughs> eating blueberries won't make you blue, and eating fat doesn't automatically make you fat. Do you know, whereas some people think, you know, if I automatically have a steak with a lot of fat on, it's going straight to my thighs. Do you know? Um, yeah. And I think that almost telling people that look, if you eat real foods, that's hopefully locally grown, um, and there's not a, a myriad of ingredients in it. <clears throat> chances are, it's it's going to be a good, healthy food for you. It's not going to be you know potatoes aren't bad for you rice is not the devil carbs aren't you know carbs aren't going to kill you um that the amount of information is out there if you if you look for something bad with a certain food like i'm sure you will find something somewhere online if you search for it to say blueberries are terrible for you that there's something in it that's going to kill you if you have enough you know and i think that's an important point to remember even when it comes to science you know you could probably go into pubmed right now and find a an article or a paper or some piece of research published to tell you that sugar is really really good for you yeah. you know so important to remember that and 
especially when you see media headlines telling you, you know, something amazing has just been discovered and, and, and maybe your antenna is up kind of going, hmm, not so sure about that. <laughs> You're likely right. You know? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I can appreciate that. I do think it's a very overwhelming space nutrition. And I think, and here, here's my rant, right? Go for <laughs> it. I love a good rant. <laughs> no, but you know what? Again, like my grandmother, I remember telling her, like she, when she passed away, I had, when she, just before she passed away, I had just graduated. And I remember telling her, I was all fired up, you know, Nanny, I've just studied nutrition therapy, I've just graduated, it's brilliant, I love it. She's like, what, so what are you, what are we doing, you know? And I remember saying, well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the therapeutics of food, you know, it's, it's teaching people about why certain foods are so good for them and, and how it can really, really help. You mean to tell me, you're going to be someone now who tells me how to eat. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And I often think of her, you know, at the moment, like we have movement coaches we have breath work coaches we have life coaches we have even you know nutrition coaches whatever <laughs> like our intuition about 50 years ago or 60 years ago would have told us or 100 years ago even before that what was good to eat and what wasn't and our intuition would have told us it was good to move you know and it felt good to move and to do a bit of physical work whether it was digging or you know building or just whatever right it was just part of your day our intuition, I suppose, brought us to maybe prayer, you know, and that was our quiet space or that was what we would now call mindfulness or reflection or whatever and spirituality and, and that world. And we knew when it was dark, you went to bed. You didn't need someone to tell you that sitting up looking at something in, you know, two o'clock in the morning wasn't good for you. <laughs> and I just think actually a lot of the root cause of all of our issues at the moment is we're just we're so far removed from what's intuitive, you know, it's like we have to be told yeah. what to do and told when to show up and how to be, you know, how to behave and, and what to buy and how to dress and all of it, you know, it's yeah. like we need to be told. And actually, if you can just say to yourself, right, you know, what? I'm going to start with the basics, whatever it is, whatever it is, whether it's your food or your movement or your sleep or whatever, <clears throat> just look at the fundamentals and if you're feeling overwhelmed just kind of say well look I know this worked for me in the past if it's your sleep you know I know I, I'm not someone who goes to bed early if I go to bed early I'll be awake at cockrow and then I still don't sleep great so maybe I am better going to bed a bit later sleeping solid and maybe you know getting a walk in the next day so that actually I'm I'm wrecked for bed by 11 or 12 o'clock that night and I'll sleep soundlier I just think <clears throat> a lot of the information is within us but we just can't or don't tap into it is it a case of that like, we don't like taking responsibility as in we don't want to be we don't want to be our own fault that we haven't succeeded at something we need to fall back on saying well my nutritional therapist told me that i should eat this and it's not work as opposed to i tried it myself and it's not working so i'll try something else um the intuition side of it that you said i find really interesting because I think a lot of people, if you told them, right, what changes do you want to make right now to improve the food that you eat? Most people, they'll, they'll cut out the crap, they'll reduce their takeaways, they might come off the drink for a couple of weeks, do you know, they start eating healthier foods, they'll add in more veg. Um, and as you said, it, it can be as complicated as you want it to be, but you can also make it as easy as you want it to be too. Yeah, and it's all about moving forward, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Like someone might, might come to me and their diet is already in a really good place, <clears throat> but maybe they have, as I said, sir, a, a, you know, said condition like diabetes, for example. And I will still see things that I know could really help lower their blood sugars, lower the cholesterol. You know, maybe one of their goals is like, oh, my GP has warned me if I don't really get my blood sugars in check that I'm going to need insulin or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I can look and say, right, look, there's definitely a lot more we can do here. So there's, there's that very tailored approach. But yes, I think you can make it, you can, you can simplify. I think also a lot of people just think, and I think it's a cultural thing. It's nearly like we think our ill health or our whatever, poor sleep or whatever it might be, um, just happened to us. Do you know what I mean? There's no reason. It's just... I can't, I can't believe it. This is that, that happened to me. And, and yes, yeah. don't get me wrong. Life does happen and, you know, things get thrown at you. Um, 
but it, a lot of it is set up by our environment, whether it's our diet, whether it's our stress, or whether it's because we're in the job that we hate and that's what's driving us to see comfort, you know, in that bottle of wine or in overeating or whatever it is. But um, I, I, I do think, I know what you're saying about personal responsibility and, you know, do we kind of just want to hand it over to someone else? What I think people, in my opinion, and, and I really hope this doesn't, doesn't come across badly, but what I think we're missing is people realizing that things, when it comes to health anyway, things don't tend to just happen to you. Even if genetics play a role um, in terms of cancer, it, it, it is, has been reported that you know, approximately 15% of cancers are, have some sort of genetic component to them. The other 85% are diet and lifestyle and environment related. So that could be exposed yeah. to something, eating something, breathing something, whatever it could be. So I think we're kind of, I, for me, that's a big piece that I, I, I'm always trying to bring people's awareness to without a judgment, you know, without saying, because everyone's doing the best, you know, no one would, no one would uh, knowingly make themselves ill, right? So I think a lot of it is just realizing, well, actually, I, I, I do think it's because you've had, you know, too much white bread or whatever it is that this is why you are where you are, you know? Yeah. I, I, okay, you mightn't have been living on Coke and crisps and chips for the past few years, but there maybe are other factors that have driven this condition. So, yeah, that's something I'm always trying to bring people's awareness to, I suppose. I'd, l I'd love to dig into that a little bit more and I'll make a note here um, for things that I'd like to dig into with you. But before we finish up today, what I would like to talk to you about is everyone at the moment, um, and I'm seeing it through my social media feeds, I'm totally guilty of it myself um maybe like you said earlier snacking too much finding comfort in a bottle of wine um or three um do you know we're <laughs> we're social distancing from restaurants so there's probably takeaways that are dropping bags at people's doors and it's easy and we don't have to go to the supermarket and, and shop in terms of emotional eating or people that find themselves snacking a lot is there any strategies that you would use with with clients or that you've used yourself um to stop yourself constantly going to the fridge or to the pantry um or just kind of i suppose emotional eating is only a problem if you, if you do it and it's affecting your health i suppose like you said at the end of it a long day if you have a glass of wine that chills you out great but if you find yourself constantly eating processed foods because you're stressed and tired and don't sleep I've rambled and I've lost, <laughs> I've, lo I've lost the point to the question, but in terms of emotional eating, I suppose is where I'm getting at. Um, you know, how, like you said, how big a role do things like stress play um, and a lack of sleep or disturbed sleep play with, with that? Yeah, I think, look, do you know what I would say to everyone at the moment is look, be kind to yourself and all we can do is survive. And this is temporary, right? This, this scenario is temporary. So that's a good thing as we know this won't last forever, right? No, it won't. It won't, it won't. Um, um, let me see. So it's tricky. Yeah, it's really challenging. And I think what a lot of people are finding is, especially if they're working from home, it's a lot of computer work. They're kind of like they're bookmarking their way through the day going, oh, it's 11 o'clock now. I put the kettle on. And sure, when I put the kettle on, the kettle's just there and the biscuits are just there. Sure, I'll have two or three of them. And then it's like, mm, I'm hungry now, but it's not quite lunchtime. I'll make another cup of tea and I'll have another bicky. And you're kind of book, you know, you're, you're just making little breaks for yourself. And then comes five o'clock when you can down tools. And it's like, sure, I'll pour a glass of wine while I'm cooking the dinner or whatever, so, you know, tuning out and watching telly for half an hour. Um, I can totally see why people would do it. And also at the moment, like for a lot of people, their friends are their outlet or their family are their outlet yeah. or their gym was their outlet. Um, and all of those things have been removed and it's really hard. So what I would say is I, I kind of would just wipe away whatever anyone is carrying at the moment and just say, look, just kind of go with it. However, that said, I personally think there's huge opportunity for all of us to come out the other side of this, maybe with some lovely new habits in place. Do you know what I mean? That maybe you have the time and the space to focus on other good stuff. Um, myself, I have been trialing just the last two weeks a little bit of, I would have always done a little bit of intermittent fasting and kind of dabbled. 
Um, I've taken it a little bit more seriously now the last couple of weeks and did a little experiment on myself and my husband. He was a very willing guinea pig. <laughs> um, so <laughs> genuinely was, didn't have to persuade him. He's great. He's usually up for a challenge like that. So yeah, and, and I suppose what I'm doing is, I'm like for me personally, my goal is not to commit the other side of this COVID lockdown heavier you know feeling just feeling unwell I just want to be ready to hit the ground running so I've tried to set myself a goal of right this is what I'm doing I'm normally I'd be the first person to say I you know I'd probably be my own worst client I wouldn't be the most compliant um I love the ideology of it but I would be someone who needs to make changes really slowly you know so if someone was making changes with me I was listening to a fascinating cast out in a walk the other day and it was all about habits this chap who was delivering it was um, a like human behavior expert. And he was saying, you know, if you want to set someone a habit that they are going to stick with for life, and let's just say, he said, let's take ex exercise as the example. You know, he said, you set up a program for them. You get them like sweating buckets, you know, three times a week, absolutely killing themselves. And you think this is great now, they're going to get results. They will, but after a month, you may never see them again, you know? Yeah. And he said, what he was, what he, what his advice was: start slowly. Tell someone, you know what? When you're brushing your teeth in the morning, I want you to do five squats. And if you can do those five squats, do another five when you brush your teeth again in the night, and come back to me in two weeks' time. Um, and it's all about those little slow incremental changes. So I think for anyone at home at the moment, or anyone, you know, whenever they're listening to this, COVID may be long over it's really start slowly just maybe start crowding out some of the bad stuff like saying to yourself right do you know what <clears throat> at the moment coffee and biscuits are my absolute achilles heel maybe you just don't buy the biscuits maybe you say to yourself i'll have a nice bit of dark chocolate or i'll have a you know a nice yogurt or something like that with at my with my 11s but that's the only change that you make you know for two weeks and say right if i can commit to that and i can get that going well, then maybe I can tackle the takeaways or the three bottles of wine on a Friday night or all the other stuff. But start making little changes that are really achievable that you know you can do, that you engage, can engage with. And that you, you're not going to feel like you failed if you don't do them, you know. I like that because I, I actually did a post on my page, I don't know, if two or three days ago, but it about people tend to start um, and they go, they do too much too soon, basically, whether it's nutrition or exercise and um, you know it's it's hitting the gym six days a week it's cutting out every single food that you really like um and almost punishing yourself and saying right i'm going to stick this really strict diet and it just ends up mm. in them hating life hating the way that the changes that they've made and they don't stick to it long enough to, to see the the benefit of any of the changes that they made anyway that's it and i know you touched on it there at the start and i think it's really important like we must remember Food is a huge source of pleasure in our lives. That doesn't mean it should be worshipped, but it is, you know, we break bread with people. You want to see good friends, you go for dinner with them. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's a huge cultural way of, of, I suppose, connecting and communicating. And so it should be, you know, that's what it should be. But it should, you know, obviously you want to be enjoying good food, but that's it. It's to not make it punitive. It's to not be like withholding, the food that you love from yourself in a kind of a punishing way absolutely um and on that note Gemma, um i want to ask you what is your favorite food or meal i was thinking about this <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking about this and i was talking to a friend earlier um about i i i have a busy day tomorrow a really long day tomorrow and she was saying to me oh why don't you you know so buy you're doing takeaways why don't you to, um text in your order early in the day and I have to say like Thai food is some of my absolute favorite but genuinely I really mean this I couldn't choose I, I, do, I do love pretty much everything like I would be as happy as Larry with a bag of salty chips out in Tremor oh, as I would with the be days. on another I know on another <laughs> given day as I would be with like an amazingly divine authentic three course Thai meal in Sabai, as I would be with lentil dal and some amazing prawn buna or something like that from an Indian, as I would be with my mother's Sunday roast. I, I do, I love it all. Like there's not one 
the sushi no absolutely not give me anything okay. else for sushi and i'll happily eat it i hope you're taking notes on that now mark <laughs> 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 and tell me, is there is there any food that you like? You you obviously you probably answered this already with sushi, but is there any food that you just you're like, oh yuck? I can't understand why people would eat cold wet fish. I just really can't. Um, what else? I did a Facebook post recently. I'm trying to like celery because the health benefits are so good. Yeah. I do. I like pretty much every other vegetable. I'm a bit on the fence about courgette, depending on how it's cooked. Um, but celery is one that for, oh my God, I mean, it was like, you know, it was like garlic to a vampire. <laughs> if you put celery in front of me, I'm working on it. I can, I, I do, I actually quite like it cooked now. Um, and I, it is lovely cooked, but you know, only recently I saw a colleague of mine and she had a post up, it was a little snack idea and it was like a stick of celery, just like kind of chopped in half. And there's a little bit of pesto on it and a little bit of cream cheese either end. And I kind of thought maybe, maybe I could do it. And I prepared a couple here and then I went, no, I just <laughs> scooped off the cream cheese and the pesto and left the celery. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, Gemma, thanks so much for coming on and having a, a chat with me. It kind of, I don't know how you, I feel like we, we skim the surface and I'd love to maybe revisit and, and do this again at a, at a later date, um, picking a couple of topics we could dig into a little, a little bit deeper. Um, Happily. But yeah, look, thanks for coming on. Um, I hope that... Like you said, the, the whole lockdown COVID situation doesn't last too much longer. We can all get back to some semblance of, of normality. And um, hopefully you, the family and everyone belong to you, stay, stay safe and well. Likewise, Mark. Take care of yourselves. All the best. Thanks, Emil. Gemma, take care. Bye. Bye.